Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, how do I follow those two excellent speeches? Huh? Uh, very moving indeed. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much to Helen and to PSR for organizing this great symposium. I'm, uh, I'm going to be discussing um, perhaps uh, a couple of the most important aspects uh, of Fukushima. One is the, the source term, actually what actually happened, what came out, and secondly, I'm going to make a stab at trying to estimate some of the health effects from the, uh, uh, the fallout from Fukushima. Um, this is what I'm going to be discussing. I'm going to be looking at some photos of the disaster, some maps of the fallout dispersion, some of the uh, uh, chat about some of the f source terms, although there's uh, quite a lot of question about them. And then I'm going to be going on to health effects, initial health effects, which we're already seeing, and what to expect in the future. And then I'm going to finish, uh, finish with collective doses. Um, yesterday afternoon, David uh, Remner came and talked about the importance of population doses. That's the same thing as collective doses. Um, this is the uh, earthquake in uh, um, um, March 2011. Um, I'm going to run some, we've seen some of these before. Um, this is uh, Fukushima Daiichi. Um, this is the uh, tsunami hitting uh, Fukushima. That's been seen before. This one hasn't. This uh, shows the uh, height of the surge, over 130 feet high, hitting the sea wall. And this shows the, uh, uh, the water surging through the plant. This is about 30 feet high, the water wall going through. Um, these are photographs of uh, the interior of the plant, um, showing uh, the water particularly in the, the bottom three slides, D, E, and F, um, submerging important equipment. On March the 12th, there was a, an explosion at the, uh, Unit 1. On March, two days later, March the 14th, an, an explosion at Unit 3. You can see it's quite different from the explosion. I'll just point out uh, here, this, deb this debris here is, is huge. And uh, in a future slide, I'll show you what, uh, what the effect is of the, this massive amount of uh, debris going up. The next thing is that on March the 15th, and this is not really very clear, uh, TEPCO do their best to try and hide this, but about uh, just shortly after 6 o'clock in the morning, Japanese time, there was a quote-unquote explosive event in the fuel pond at Unit 2, and that was followed seconds later by another explosive event in the spent fuel pond at Unit 4. So these two events on the 15th were in very, very intimately connected and we don't know the reason why yet. And then the next day on March the 16th, again early in the morning there was a major explosion at Unit 4, that's the fuel pond. Those two um, explosions on the 15th and 16th were not videotaped because it was dark and there was no TV crews actually taking um, uh, footage at the time. Um, this gives a, a timeline of the various explosions. Um, I should say, and I would uh, re sort of reflect what um, Arnie Gardnerson said, that there's a lot of questions yet. You know, many emissions and high radiation levels which are still unexplained. Um, we're still, in, only two years after the accident, we're still piecing things together and TEPCO is running interference and making damn sure that we don't find out what's going on. But nevertheless, um, if we can look here at the damage to, we've seen some of these before, um, the damage to the reactors 4, 3, 2 and 1, 4, three, two, and one. Um, and going on from the, the top, um, these are the reactors three, two, and one. Three, two, and one. And you can see here, you can see here 
This, these holes and the turbine holes are a result of the falling debris from the reactor. These are huge holes, about 20, 30 feet in diameter, which means that big chunks of the reactor um, and or fuel pond went straight up into the air. And yes, you heard yesterday Arnie Gunderson say that he thought that perhaps there was a criticality involved, but that was a minority view. Well, I share that view. Um, it doesn't matter if it's a minority, there's a quite a bit of evidence suggesting that something more than a hydrogen explosion took place. Of course, <laughs> of course um, the officials, uh, TEPCO and the J Japanese government agencies, deny it. But um, there's far too much plutonium and uh, uranium lying around the rest of Fukushima for there not to have been a criticality accident. Uh, 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 event, I should say. So we'll see in future what actually happens. Again, more the damage from uh, to reactors four and reactor three. So just to recap what happened. There was four, ex at least four explosions in the reactors at units one, two, and three, and uh, uh, in the spent fuel pond at unit four. There was. Um, overheating in the four uh, spent fuel ponds, and there was a, a fire in Unit 4. There were cold core marathons in reactor in Units 1, 2, and 3, and we don't really know where the fuel, the melted fuel is. It's probably the, the basements of the 1, 2, and 3, but we're not absolutely sure. Many workers were, uh, suffered very high radiation levels, 250 millisieverts plus, um, big uh, evacuations as well. We'll go on to that. About 12,000, putting some numbers, 12,000 workers were exposed. Um, about 100,000 people were evacuated. Lots, lots of contamination of uh, food and water. And about 8% of Japan's surface area was contaminated. These are the evacuation areas. They're color-coded so you can follow them. I think that rather than me just discussing this in great detail, if you want to, you can download this or you'll be given copies of it so you can study it at your leisure. But the, um, the pink, the green, and the uh, purple areas all had different um, parameters about when and uh, the numbers of people who were evacuated. Here again, more precise data uh, about evacuation numbers and zones. This is um, a photograph, uh, uh, an image from um, surveys done by U.S. military, basically, um, of helicopters about 100 meters above the surface, measuring le cesium levels, uh, both 134 and 137, and you can see here um, a distinct horseshoe-shaped um, pattern of um, deposition from the plumes at Fukushima. Also, you can see there's um, quite a lot of population centers. These are the, uh, the purple colored, colored areas. Um, here, 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 here. These are high population areas. You say, well, why are you mentioning population areas? Because it's where there's high populations that you get the deaths. And it's where you get high population doses. There's people that count. If the radiation falls in an area where there, nobody lives, then we're perhaps less concerned. This shows some of the dust levels, similar to the previous slide, but given some numbers uh, of the doses. Um, as you can see here, we're talking about doses of up to millisieverts, 50 millisieverts a year. None of that is taken into account in the recent WHO report, which uh, is a disgrace in many ways. Um, but going on, this slide is on its side. I couldn't, for the life of me, get it to go up and down, <laughs> north and south. But can you imagine? This is um, this is the curve here of the that I showed you before, the horse-shaped shoe shape. Now this is here is Greater Tokyo, a population of 35 million or so, and you can see, yeah that parts of, of, of Tokyo were contaminated. Now, even if um, 
the population of Tokyo only got an average dose of a, of a millisiever, so that's still a huge dose in terms of, of um, the um, population dose of 30,000 person sievers is very large indeed. Just going on. It wasn't just Japan, it was the rest of the world. And this shows you the contamination as measured by Stoll and his associates in Norway. Stoll, is, he's an important person for you to try and remember his name, S-T-O-H-L. Um, they used the data from the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization measurement stations throughout the world. Makes me wonder why it didn't occur with Chernobyl, but anyway, they did it for, um, uh, for Fukushima. And you can see um, the deposition throughout the rest of the world. Essentially, what this slide shows is that every single one of us has bought a, a reverse lottery ticket do you remember what uh, David Brenner said yesterday about um, the fact that um, if you're spreading very small doses over a large population, it's basically a reverse lottery ticket. And like a real lottery ticket, some people are going to get it. Some either With a, an ordinary lottery ticket, you won the jackpot, but with a reverse lottery ticket, you die. We don't know who it is, and the risk could be, individual risk could be very small, but people will die. And that's why collective doses are really important to, to measure. We live in a society, in a capitalist society, where we value individual freedoms and individual rights and individual doses and put a lot of emphasis on it. Yeah, okay, but collective doses are important too. So if you pick up nothing else from this conference, Please try and remember that we should try emphasize collective doses. And I'll give you another reason why, and that is that the World Health Organization and UNSCARE and IEA are all trying to downplay collective doses. Your response? Pick it up. Right. It's important. Um, the next slide is uh, again by Stoll. And it's not very clear, but it's the best I've got. Um, this is Japan again, here. And you can see that um, most of the cesium fell on the sea on the Pacific Ocean. Yeah. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm trying a, a, a bit of a comparison between Fukushima and, and uh, Chernobyl because it's by comparisons that you learn. And you get an idea of what, uh, where we are, get a handle on it. If you compare the two, and the fallout from Chernobyl was over a much larger area in terms of high concentrations. Uh, Chernobyl was uh, over land, not in the sea. Whereas in, in Fukushima, about 80% of the, certainly the cesium fallout was over the sea rather than land, only 20% over land. However, in Japan, the population densities were much higher than they were in Ukraine and Belarus and, uh, and the Soviet Union. At Chernobyl also, we think that the, uh, the source terms were larger. I'll come to that in a minute. So it gives you an idea of uh, the differences and similarities between the two. This is a slide which most Ameri North Americans are not really aware. So I'm gonna let you have a look at it. This is the depositions of cesium throughout Europe. In essence, ladies and gentlemen, Europe was clobbered. 60% uh, of the fallout from Chernobyl fell on Western Europe. The highest concentrations were in Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia, but the actual amounts were spread throughout the whole of um, Western Europe. There's one slightly funny aspect in that, and that is if you look at France here, La Belle France. The French government announced that the, um, that the uh, Chernobyl fallout couldn't possibly have landed in France. <laughs> it was a, the trouble, we can laugh at it now, but at the time they took it seriously, I kid you not. And uh, um, when this data came out, they were, um, as a, uh, the result was that a number of cabinet ministers had to resign. I kid you not. Uh, <laughs> 
And another thing is that, you know, one of the, for those people who are uh, students of irony, so to speak, is if you look at the UK, um, yeah. the highest doses that fell out from the plume fell on Sellafield. <laughs> it was quite, quite funny. Um, but just going on a little bit, I'm going to look now at this, at this area here in the next slide. This is it here. And this is, this is Chernobyl. And you can see the, the concentrations uh, which fell. Um, these are high concentrations uh, in the immediate area. Now, the next slide is going to be a bit of a shocker, um, but I hope you'll take it on the chin. Um, I've superimposed here Fukushima on top of the map that I showed you previously. It was the same scale. And the colors are roughly, the, uh, again, to the same scale. So it gives you an idea of the respective sizes of the fallouts. Now, you're not just to take away from that that uh, Fukushima is not important. Of course it is. It's very serious indeed. It's just that Chernobyl was a catastrophe. And I use the word advisedly. Um, Alexei used the word, and I totally agree. It was a, and is, a catastrophe for the rest of Europe. And Japan's got its own one now. Um, I'm not minimizing Japan at all, Fukushima at all. It's just that, in the scale of things, oh, geez, Chernobyl was, was and is very bad. And I'm going to talk now a little bit about um, the source term. It's quite... It's quite debatable. The most important nuclides are cesium yeah. um, from uh, Fukushima. There's quite a bit of debate. Yesterday, Ken Busler showed there was a number of estimates. Um, the Japanese ones are all about 10 petabecarols yeah. instead of 36 from Fukushima. Uh, for, I hope you don't mind my using these words of Pedrebeckerol is basically 15 zeros after uh, after one, a humongous amount, a humongous amount of radioactivity. Um, so that's uh, it's a quadrillion uh, disintegrations per second. <laughs> that's pretty large. But anyway, um, if you look at the two cesium uh, numbers here, they're three and a half times what all the, the other Jap official Japanese uh, estimates were. But I don't believe the Japanese official estimates. I don't trust them one inch. So I tend to pr prefer the estimates by Stoll and, and his colleagues in Norway. Now, you may say, well, why do you believe, and that's from the Norwegian Protection, Radiation Protection Agency, well, why do you believe them? Well, Norway doesn't have any nuclear power stations. Okay, very important. And also, if you look at the iodine, I still didn't measure iodine, unfortunately. Here. And uh, so I had to go for another d data source, and I used the Austrian uh, Environment Protection Agency data. Why did I use Austria? There's no nuclear power station in Austria. One of the things I've learned, I've been in this area for a long time, and one of the areas, one of the things I've found out is, any country that's got nuclear power in it, the information data sources are contaminated. <laughs> a couple of points also from this slide is that you'll see that, uh, that the um, um, radioactive novel gas xenon 133, half-life of about five days, um, um, actually, more was emitted from Fukushima than Chernobyl, mainly because there was three reactors that uh, went up, uh, whereas at Chernobyl there was one. Um, these data show very roughly that um, what I had shown earlier, that, that the effect from Fukushima was about an order of magnitude lower than the effect from, from uh, Chernobyl. Now, um, this is an interesting slide, which I said to you that Chernobyl was really, really bad. Hey, guess what was worse? Well, let you look at it for a second. The important is the x-axis. 
which gives you the time. Yeah. The year is 1960, oh, 55, 60, 65. Guess what happened then? You got it. It was the atmospheric bomb tests. And you can see that it put out a huge amount of cesium into the atmosphere. Um, in 1986, yeah, um, you had Chernobyl, which was short, sharp and sweet, 10 days, followed by, um, as you can see, the body burden of cesium there. And uh, this is uh, becquerels per kilo, uh, millibecquerels per square, or cubic meter, so in, in the air. Um, the trouble is that not many people really study the effects of the atomic bomb tests, but they are serious. Going on. Um, in February 28th this year, um, I think it was time uh, uh, to, to um, sort of negate the anniversary um, meetings and uh, conferences. Uh, for the second anniversary of Fukushima. They rushed the report out. In fact, there's a number of typos in it. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, anyway, the WHO report um, said that um, there was little bits of uh, little increases in breast cancer and leukemia amongst uh, people who were um, near Fukushima, but a big increase in women um, of thyroid cancer risk. Um, that's probably the case. However, I, I, uh, I'm, I think that breast cancer and leukemia incidences actually may be bigger than this. Again, WHO report is very vague. It said risk for protected be, uh, predicted to be low, no discernible increase outside of Japan, which is nonsense. And uh, a third of emergency workers have increased risks. Well, so what? I mean, the thing is that you should try and get numbers to these, and, and they haven't done it. And the WHO report. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we can expect to happen at Fukushima, unfortunately, using Chernobyl as a guide. Um, in the initial nine month period after March the 11th, 2011, we can expect to see teratogenic effects, in other words, effects from exposures in utero to uh, embryos and fetuses, and they're listed there. After two years, um, we expect to see leukemias increasing yeah, in adults, but they are really hard to pick up because um, leukemia is a relatively rare disease. After four years, we expect to see increases in thyroid cancers coming along. And after 10 years, solid cancers and various other effects, particularly cardiovascular effects. That's what we expect to see in that timeline. Now, we are already two years past. So I've said here, within the first nine months, are there any effects? Well, yes, there are. And it's due to a gentleman called Dr. Alfred Kerblein, uh, who lives in Nuremberg, that um, we owe a great deal of thanks because he's dug up the data and, he, and this is what he's found. He found an infant, a peak in infant mortality about six weeks after the uh, uh, February, sorry, March the 11th, 2011. And um, Alexa showed this before. But we can, this peak here um, is uh, quite significant. It shows that, um, I'll just go on to the next slide, it shows a threefold increase in infant mortality rate, um, uh, um, which is statistically significant. Instead of the, the, the observed rate was about nine per thousand, and the expected was about three, so a threefold increase. We're not absolutely sure what's going on here, but um, basically these infant deaths are, uh, are an anomaly. Uh, we've seen them, uh, and they've happened elsewhere. 
Now there's a second event, uh, and that is, in fact, I should say, uh, a decline in live birth numbers. And this happens nine months after March the 11th. It's, uh, this is observable not only in uh, Fukushima Prefecture, but also in the whole of Japan. In Fukushima, um, there was a reduction in the birth of the live birth numbers of 15%. And in all of Japan, about 5%. These are statistically significant. This is, these are big enough numbers for us to know there's something going on here. Now, the next slide is I'm going to be showing you is the standardized residuals. And we looked at the data and turned it so that on its side so you can actually see it of monthly data for Fukushima Prefecture. And you can see the, uh, the number of live births, nine months later, falls off a cliff. Yeah. After, um, nine months after the uh, events in uh, Fukushima. Now, a good question you might want to ask is, well, did we see it elsewhere? Yeah, we do. Um, on the left, you can see the slide for uh, Fukushima Prefecture, and on the right, you can see Kiev City, which is, uh, and, and uh, this is after Chernobyl, nine months after Chernobyl. Yeah. Again, the number of live births fell off a cliff. So we've already seen effects, uh, in utero effects or teratogenic effects. Another teratogenic effect, although it's rarely acknowledged as such, is infant leukemias. Way back in the 1950s and 60s, uh, Alice Stewart, um, who was a personal friend of both Bob Alvarez and Kitty Tucker and myself, a wonderful, wonderful woman, um, she found in her uh, Oxford survey of childhood cancers that um, there was a 168% uh, increase in leukemias. Sorry, wrong one. She found a doubling of the number of uh, infant leukemias born to women who were irradiated by x-rays during pregnancy. And in 1987, this was actually shown after Chernobyl. There was a 168% increase in Belarus infants. And this was spotted by again by Dr. Alfred Kerblein. Now, in all of, this, right, in all of the slides, I've given you um, here the, um, the web addresses so you can do your own digging and find it out, yeah? Uh, by the way, that um, childhood leukemias or infant leukemias hasn't been studied yet at, uh, at Fukushima, but it could be. I'm going to move now to adult leukemias, which we would expect to see, well, from now on, actually, uh, two years after the event. That's when you begin to see adult leukemias. Adult leukemias were difficult to pick up at Chernobyl, um, but mainly because of the, you're looking for a small signal in uh, an area where there's a lot of noise. Um, but just recently, in January this month, and this year, Jablotska, did a study of over 110,000 Chernobyl liquidators. Uh, liquidator is a technical term meaning people who go in and clean up the mess and they're exposed to large amounts of radioactivity. Well, um, she found a linear dose response and I'll show you the next slide. Now this is really important because uh, for a number of reasons. One is that it's a very clear evidence of leukemia increases. Um, and it's, the results were statistically significant because even though the effect's small, you've got big, big numbers, as I say, 110,000 uh, people. The amount of work they put into this was just amazing. Uh, looking at case records for 110,000 people, <laughs> it takes a long time. Um, one of the um, significant things is if, if you look at the actual data points here, we're down to about uh, 10, 15 millisieverts. So whenever anybody tells you, oh, there's no effects from radiation below uh, 100 millisieverts, well, I'm on a pile of, a crock of S, basically. Look at this stuff here. <laughs> Just going on. 
Now, one of the things that we should, uh, we would expect after about four or five years are increases in thyroid cancer. Already, we've seen increases in um, cysts and nodules in children uh, in Fukushima last year and this year. Uh, I've double-checked this with a number of scientists, um, what, what, what the significance of this, and I have to say that there's conflicting results, and it's basically hard to say what's actually going on here. All I can say is that, and this is the important thing, after four, from Chernobyl, after four years, we're going to, probably we're going to see increases in thyroid cancers. That's the key thing. Maybe not as much as, at, uh, thankfully, at, as at Chernobyl for this reason. In, at Chernobyl, all of the, the people there were, um, had very low levels of iodine because they lived thousands of kilometers from the sea and they had not much fish in their diet. Whereas in Japan, all of the people live very near the sea and they all have very rich diets in fish and seaweed. So their, their thyroids were stacked up with stable iodine, okay? And whereas in Chernobyl, they were starved of iodine and when the, the radioactive iodine came out, they gobbled it up and took it in. So with any luck, the thyroid cancer incidence at uh, Fukushima won't be so as severe as occurred at, after Chernobyl. And it was severe after Chernobyl. This is uh, um, data showing the epidemic of thyroid cancers in Belarus uh, after Fukushima. And you can see here, this is adults. And they don't say this in the chart, but it's adult women, almost totally. Um, I don't want to steal the thunder of following speakers, but there's quite a clear gender difference here. A woman really got it in terms of thyroid cancers after Chern Chernobyl. Okay, better get on. But um, I mentioned earlier on about that we need to talk about population risks versus individual risks. There's a lot of emphasis on individual risks, but really we need to talk about population risks as well. As I mentioned, there's a reverse lottery going on, but real people will die. I want to now talk about, um, and finish off with a few, um, because we know of these uh, exposures from the uh, fallout throughout Japan and elsewhere, you can make estimates of the number of people who will die from cancer. You, once you've got the collective dose, you can multiply by a risk factor of, say, 10% per siebert, and get an estimate of, of the number of fatal cancers. Now, there have been three studies so far. The French study by the Institut de Radio Protection et Surete Nucléaire, the first one, um, Tenhove and Jacobson out in the West Coast at uh, Lawrence Livermore, and Jan Bia and Ed Lyman and Frank von Hippo uh, um, here in uh, the East Coast, uh, Frank's at, uh, at Princeton. These three have made the following estimates. Frank, and by the way, these, I've corrected these data so that there's no draft applied because one, one of the funny things from the WHO report was that they said we shouldn't be applying drafts. Um, uh, so, uh, draft is a fudge factor and I don't have time to explain it. Basically, it reduced the number of deaths. And if you don't have to apply it, then the deaths go up. Um, Frank von Hippel said about maybe about 1,000, 1,500 deaths. The, the French government report said about 220. Um, uh, Tenhoven Jacobson said about 170. Uh, Jan Veya and his colleagues about 700. And I made my own study uh, showing about 3,000 deaths. I'll be clear about this. This is from Grand Shine only. No internal doses, just ground shine. That was the cesium landing on the ground. And, but it's estimated over 70 years. That's how long this, the cesium will last, 70 years into the future. And if you compare that with Chernobyl, again, no draft, you can see the numbers are much larger, at least an order of magnitude, probably two orders of magnitude larger. I'm gonna finish off on um, uh, some citizen activist uh, results. Um, these are people who are not officials, they have no connection with the Japanese uh, so-called radiation protection bodies. Uh, Professor Hoyama, 
Um, he studied whole body counts um, of internal radiation of people who, all the people who came into his hospital between October 2011 and November 2011. He wasn't paid to do this. He just did it himself because he was so concerned. Uh, 30,000 people, that's a lot of people. Um, his measurement protocols were good. I double checked them with colleagues in the in UK. And the key thing that it came out with was that, and this is encouraging news for the Japanese people here and people in, in, uh, in Fukushima, is that there's been a decline in the number of people who tested positive for internal cesium. And that's a, we can take something forward from that, from 12% uh, in uh, 2011 down to 3% in 2012. That's really encouraging news. And after May 2012, no cesium detected in the children so far. And that's a big number. To, uh, 10,000. That's good. That's, uh, Hirata is on the cusp of the horseshoe, um, if you can imagine the, the follow-up. Um, just go on very quickly. Um, another citizen scientist, um, well, they're from, they're called the uh, Safecast people, Asby Brown, if you know, happen to know him, good bloke. Uh, a, a citizen scientist, no connection with officialdom, I trust them. They have glass badge data, which is like a film badge with a glass badge. And he, what he showed was that, or they showed, was that the actual levels of um, uh, external radiation are declining from here, 2011, down to 2012. The yellow bit here is the decline. In other words, it's, the graph is moving to the left, showing that doses are going down. And that's, again, encouraging news. This is not TEPCO speaking. These are ordinary citizen scientists doing their own measurements, and I believe them. Big numbers as well. Um, I haven't talked about internal radiation um, in terms of the food here, um, but it's um, really encouraging that there's no fish allowed to be, uh, all the fishing has been stopped. Big demonstrations, um, which is great. I'd like to finish off by saying that uh, uh, this is the words of George Santayana, um, a philosopher who said that governments and people who are unable to learn from history are condemned to repeat it. My thanks to these scientists. This has been a, a collaborative effort by a number of scientists, uh, scientists particularly um, Alfred Corbein, who we all, all owe a great deal of thanks. I noticed yesterday that um, there were a lot of questions and there weren't, and oftentimes they weren't really satisfactorily answered, um, because just because of time. Um, can I point you to <laughs> a bit of a shameless plug here, but to my website, which does have answers on collected doses of Fukushima, why, un who, and unseer are wrong to try and discredit population doses. The new EPI studies, big studies showing risks at small doses. Why we should still continue using LNT and the lot of evidence on there uh, below 100 millisieverts. This is what it's all about. The kids do uh, taking the brunt of Fukushima. Our hearts go out to them. Thanks.